This content is issued by Zeus Capital Limited, which is authorised and regulated in the United Kingdom by the Financial Conduct Authority, the designated investment business, and is a member firm of the London Stock Exchange. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this podcast. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and not of Zeus. Please note that participants in this podcast may have financial interests in the matters discussed. Good afternoon, good evening. Happy summer solstice. I'm Nick Searle, host of A Different Perspective, and warmly welcome you to this wonderful location for our live recording this evening. I'd like to thank our sponsor Zeus and Pata for their great organisation and production, also finding this incredible venue for this evening. So, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our two guests. Hugh Hendry, the acid capitalist, the ex-hedge fund manager and revered market commentator. Please welcome Hugh. (laughs) And now to Barry. Barry Norris, the alpha alchemist, managed a contrarian Argonaut absolute return fund. You must watch Barry's documentaries on his Argonaut website on what have fossil fuels ever done for us and the investment free lunch. Please welcome Barry. <laughs> but gentlemen, how are you both? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super loose. I mean, I, I think I'm looser than the lowest hanging fruit in the, or, the orchard. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, delight to be in London. Um, it's going to be random. And, uh, and hopefully we're going to learn something from Barry. Great to be at the Peace and Reconciliation Center. Um, the, uh, the church is named after the Abbess of Barking. So... Um, I don't know what that says, but let's have fun tonight. Thanks, Jess. I thought we could discuss a number of macro themes and see ultimately where the conversation takes us. So let's start with what does the Fed and the Bank of England do now? Inflation is still out of control. Do rates keep on rising? Hugh. Oh, 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 heavens. Um, I don't know if you saw, I, I did some Bob Dylan. I did my tribute to Bob Dylan. Um, outside the Bank of England after their last meeting uh, with the flashcards saying these guys are bozos um, and we've all been had. Um, I have this slogan which is I, and I fundamentally believe that there are no more than five people who understand money the construct of money and it is with regret to say that they do not work for central banks They don't work for Goldman Sachs either. Mostly they don't work um, for other hedge funds. Uh, I'm now going to describe myself. I am not one of them. Um, I am simply the pathway. But, you know, part of asset capitalism is, you know, to quote the great Jim Morrison, you know, what have we done to our fair sister? We've ravaged and we've plundered. Um, And a lot of that is related to policy errors, um, by those that we elect to take these decisions. Um, one, one observation is, why do we need them? You know, why do we have, here we are in the city of London, this bastion of capitalism. I know we're in a church, but we have interest rates determined by, well, with the Federal Reserve, it's 12, 12 wise people. I'm not sure if it's 12 with the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, but why do we need a Vatican uh, assembly. Um, we have literally thousands of professionals dedicated day in, day out, not just a, in the pursuit of speculation uh, to make a, a, a fast buck, but to hedge. They have to look to the future and they have to try and hedge commercial um, positions. And so you end up with a yield curve which the metaphor for me would be, it's a restaurant. You know? and, and I always, if I'm in a foreign town, I, I, dine, I dine out at busy restaurants 
when I walk past empty restaurants, which is to say, I think there is a wisdom when many people collectively um, come together and we get the synthesis of a price. Um, that's a long way of saying that we have um, an inversion in the yield curve. Um, and it's especially striking, and it's been prolonged in America. And it's the market's way of telling the Federal Reserve that it's wrong. Um, and the Bank of England is wrong. Um, I, I'm shocked. I, I, I spend, I'm permitted to spend 90 days in the United Kingdom. Um, and on, on this trip, uh, my, my family house, I'm, unfortunately I'm in the, in the entrails of divorcing, but um, the, we, we rent a house in Notting Hill and the landlord is evicting my, my ex and the kids. Why? Yeah. Uh, no, because, you know, for the longest time the rental yield was 2%. Yeah, and rates are resetting to five, six percent, and it doesn't work. Um, and they're going to sell the property. I think there's going to be a deluge of, of property coming on the market. I then go to my favourite cafe, and this place is—I mean, I'm, I know I look cheap, but this place is expensive. I mean, the a, a latte is about five or six bucks, and it has a gym. Um, place is closing down. Yeah, why? Um, if you've watched those Gordon Ramsay uh, kitchen nightmares, um, failing restaurants, um, what do the banks recommend? The first prescription is to raise prices, which is, which is a folly. I mean, the best thing would be like improve the cooking, but, but to raise prices. Um, and so what's happening is rents are going up. The, the instruction to landlords is it's, the, it's either sell or, or raise rents. And of course, so if you will, there's a, there's a degree of kind of cost price pressure coming out of the Bank of England and its actions. But raising rates, what does it solve? I've, I've said enough, but what does, it, what does it solve? You know, we have uh, particularly acute wage price inflation just now in those sectors which were traditionally, um, they were positions from people who came into the country and we've made, we've made that almost impossible. Um, for the real folk, you know, no one's getting a 10% pay increase, and there's a reason for that, and I want to explore that, but um, we'll come back to that. I want to hear uh, Barry. So a wise man once said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And so it's not caused by Vladimir Putin's war, it's not caused by greedy trade unions, it's not caused by greedy businessmen who are always greedy. Um, and so in order to really understand why we've got inflation and why interest rates are going up, we have to have a view on what has caused inflation. And not only that, but to actually try and work out why interest rates are 5% and we don't already have a global recession. Because I think when the Fed started raising interest rates only 15 or 16 months ago from 25 basis points, most people would have thought we'd already be in a global recession when they passed 2%, and now they're 5%, and we still have almost no unemployment, and we have a very strong housing market, and we have extremely strong wage growth. So I think in order to really understand what happens next, we have to explain why we had inflation and why 2% rates haven't killed the global economy. And the only rational explanation, in my view, comes from the monetarist view that during COVID, there was such an illogical response to a crisis that we need a new chapter in popular delusions and the madness of crowds, in that the global central bank balance sheets went from $20 trillion to $32 trillion in two years. I hadn't realized how this affected the real economy until I started analyzing the US banking sector about six months ago. And in those two years, deposits, customer deposits, 
went up by five trillion dollars, which is a fifty percent increase over two years. The 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 Federal Bank balance, Federal Reserve balance sheet went from four trillion to nine trillion, and we also had five trillion of fiscal stimulus. So those people that tell you that QE, oh, it's not inflationary, the money gets stuck in in bank reserves, have a four trillion dollar problem in that bank reserves went up by one trillion, but customer deposits went up by five trillion. So they printed money and the money got out into the real economy. And because of that, everyone thought that lockdown was great. They were earning more money than they'd ever earned and all they had to do was stay at home. And is that one of the reasons I wonder why one fourteenth of the UK working population is signed off long-term sick? Again, it becomes a, a productivity problem, which doesn't by itself cause inflation, but means that you have to pump more and more money into the economy to get any sort of nominal growth. So essentially, the Western world, with its decline of, of hard work and ethics, it's not going to tolerate a, a hard landing forever. You have to keep pumping more and more money in to keep the show on the road. So coming back to, to why we've still got an inflation problem, the, in, the, in the UK, we did fiscal stimulus around 16% of the economy. The Bank of England expanded their balance sheet by roughly the same amount. So slightly less than the US, but of course we've got less productivity in the UK, so it's more sticky and inflation is higher. And therefore, central banks have got a dilemma. They, you know, to a certain degree, the genie's out of the bottle. Everyone's a lot richer. People's balance sheets are a lot stronger, which is why the, econ the real economy has become desensitized to interest rates because people are living off their balance sheet. People in the US fix their mortgage at 2 or 3% so that no one cares that current mortgage rates are, are 6 or 7%. And so this buffer of money that was printed during COVID that gave everybody this one-off boost where governments essentially gave out our own money because they just either printed more or gave out future, tax, future taxes made everyone feel a lot wealthier. And now we have to pay the piper. And the piper is you've either got to take money out of the system or inflation becomes embedded and the problem is now that the u.s consumer for example is just like frankenstein's monster you know it it, it is it's it, the federal reserve has got to kill it because if it doesn't kill it the longer that people ask for six percent wage growth every year the longer you get this wage price spiral so there's an urgency in killing the wage price spiral, which has to come with higher unemployment. And people will say, well, you know, why haven't we had a recession yet? And the probability of a recession doesn't diminish just because it hasn't happened yet. In fact, I would argue it increases because actually the Federal Reserve and other central banks will have to continue to tighten if inflation, headline inflation doesn't come down. And therefore, the probability of a hard landing actually goes up the longer it takes to happen. So, you know, I, I, I would regard myself neither uh, as an inflationist or a deflationist, but actually explaining the current problem of, of high inflation or, or low growth by the, the mad money printing that went on during COVID. Yeah. Um, I love Barry. <laughs> And well, but, but then, we, but I, 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 I just discovered that we, we cross paths. Did we say for a week or for a week? Um, I was, I was departing Bailey Gifford after eight very, very miserable years, um, and Barry was just embarking on some miserable years. Um, but I take a very, very different perspective on inflation, uh, except to recognize that it is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, 
the central bank's superpower is psych ops to convince you that they actually have relevance and that they're actually doing something. Um, I dispute that. Um, the quantitative easing and the increase in the Fed's balance sheet, five trillion. So to put that in context, the US economy GDP is about 23 trillion. So you know, it's, a big, it's a big number. Um, but quantitative easing via increasing bank reserves is not printing money. You are potentially printing money. It is akin to being in an igloo. And the igloo is the metaphor because I'm thinking of Japan, which for three decades has not generated um, expansive nominal GDP growth. So it feels cold, if you will, for the folks there. And they are on their 28th iteration of quantitative easing. Now, once you get past the second or third, someone's going to ask a question and say, I don't think this thing works, but they're at 28. Uh, now, for it to work, you've got an igloo and you have spread generously a lot of gasoline all over the place. For it to take off, for us to witness higher prices, it requires someone to light a match. Yeah. So bank reserves and the, expan the expansion of it, you're facilitating the potential for the banks to go on a rip and to print money and, and then to finance persistent and perpetually higher prices. But to date, no one has dared to light the match. Now, Barry is um, incredible because, am I right in saying that you were short? Um, what's it called, the Silicon Valley? Mm. Yeah, so, but do you think of Silicon Valley, you know, I think you're half right, but I wish I was as right as you were in being short at the bank. Um, but they had a, I want to say, 70 billion increase in deposits in two years. Yeah. Okay. What did they do with $70 billion? They bought 30-year U.S. treasuries. You see, they did not light the match. Um, the economy, and I, like I said, $23 trillion of size, we have no idea how to measure it. It's three, four years later when you actually have a fairer assessment of what's happening today. You know, if you look at the minutes from the Bank of England in August of 2008, um, August 2008, yeah, um, and they decided to keep rates unchanged at five and a half, but there was one dissent. There was one loony bin who wanted to raise rates. Yeah. Um, when you look at the revised data, we were in a profound recession at that point. They didn't know. And in the ensuing years, we've had this alien body invasion called COVID, which has completely destroyed any sense of these economic econometric models, which they're very dependent on. The Bank of England, I mean, a few weeks ago in the Financial Times, there was the Mia Kalpa from Bailey. We are very sorry. We've been overly dependent on a model. We've taken decisions from the model. And our promise to you now is we won't. Yeah. So my, my son is studying PPE, politics, philosophy, and economics. I wish he was studying politics and philosophy because the economics is a waste of time. Yeah, I wish we had philosophy at the Bank of England to recognize the challenge. Um, and, and in that article, however, I said, they said, we're not going to use the model. And I went, hurrah, you know, death to econometrics. But I was curious, what, what does the model say now? And the model says they should be cutting interest rates as quickly as possible. And of course, the irony is, now they're not going to listen. So, we're screwed. So, I think coming back on, on QE, I think you've got to differentiate between the QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4. In QE4, obviously, the starting point of the Fed balance sheet was $4 billion and it went to 9 In QE1, 
we started with about an uh, 800 billion balance sheet. So they did more QE in the two years during COVID than what they'd done in, in, the, in the previous 12. So the sheer quantity of QE made a big difference, right? And if you look at QE1, it was essentially to recapitalize the banks. Banks basically um, were allowed to swap their illiquid assets with the Fed in return for, for, for increasing their bank reserves. Um, the exact size of the balance sheet really didn't increase much, and it certainly didn't seep out into the real economy, hence why it didn't cause inflation. And whenever you get um, e either banks trying to, 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 to expand their balance sheet to reflate the economy or vice versa, it's an imprecise science. So... I would argue certainly QE1, QE2, QE3, the, the amounts involved were so small, they didn't really do anything other than recapitalize the banking system or change the yield curve. But then you got to QE4, and that Fed balance sheet went from 4 to 9 billion. US bank reserves went from 2 to 3. So he, I'm afraid you've got a $4 trillion problem. You've got to explain if the balance sheet of the Fed went from five to nine, sorry, from four to nine, where did those four trillion of liabilities go? Thanks, gents. <laughs> so what else do we have to break for, for rates to start coming down? We seem to have broken a lot, as alluded to by regional banks in the US, but what more needs to happen? Well, I, I mean, this is an analogous to 2008. You know, Bear Stearns went bankrupt in February and and they're like the traffic cops are like you know move on move on that we, we've got this covered and then I think it was June we had countrywide financial when we have we had Wacovia it's fine folks we got this move on okay so uh, the, the fund the fundamental issue everyone in this room now has knowledge of something that we didn't understand last year uh, we've come to recognize that I'm holding an iPhone, and an iPhone is a weapon of mass destruction for the banking sector. Um, Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall, Barry made a fortune recognizing it. Uh, you know, we had, what, three regional banks. We call them regional, which is to, almost to, su to, to suggest they're dimin diminutive. In terms of the assets, involved with those institutions. These are amongst the largest ever historic bank failures. And of course, we had the failure of Credit Suisse in another domain, um, an institution that was deemed to be systemically important and therefore was under profound scrutiny. And it was a bank that went bankrupt with the most impeccable regulatory ratios. Yeah. Um, now, banking, a bank run historically would have been 5% of the deposits being taken out. Um, and you would slow it down, you've got to go there, you've got to present your passport, you know, and they close for lunch, whatever, yeah. Exactly, from August 2007. Um, seven, was it 79% Barry, of the deposits at, at Silicon Valley? <laughs> had been pulled after 17 hours. Yeah, it was so rapid. And so one of the issues we have today is you really, it's very hard to imagine how you can finance commercial residential loans you know, with term versus what has now become flight deposit capital. And then secondly, you have to recognize that the tightening by the Federal Reserve is the quickest and most substantial tightening they've done in the history of the Financial Reserve. They did 500 basis points in a year. Now, that is uncommon because it takes the banks 18 months typically to, to reprice their loans. And so if the banks were just to follow the Fed every, every step, their net interest margin would be devastated. Okay, so typically, if you think of the tightening cycle after, um, 
from 2004 onwards, it was 25 basis points. 25 basis points, very, very, very slow, and the, and the system was allowed uh, to adjust in a timely manner. Um, and so you have a situation now where the Fed is, the Fed is the regulator of the banks, and it's destroying the banks. You know, that when it raised rates again after uh, the demise of those banks, what was it doing? Right? It goes to five and a quarter. Um, there was a huge amount of deposits sitting in banks in America getting 36 basis points. Okay, so there's been a flight to CDs offering three and, and mutual funds. Uh, the more that the Fed seeks to raise rates, the, the more you accentuate the flight capital of deposits away from, from, from the sector. So the Fed is actually is doing harm. The regulator is doing harm. So to answer your question, there is a hell of a lot more bank failures to come. And the question in my head is, what does banking 2.0 look like? Because the existing form is dead. Yeah. So I, I would agree with a lot of that. Um, and if I look at um, money supply currently, it's falling at the fastest pace since the early 1930s in the Great Recession. So the last figure in the US was minus 4.6% year on year, which in real terms is, is double digit. And so ironically, of course, that's happening because there's too much money in the in the economy and it's an inexact process to get the the amount of money in the economy to grow in line with nominal gdp which is obviously the aim to have stable prices so it seems to me that whenever you've you've had recessions when money supply has actually been positive but whenever it's gone negative you have had a, a very deep economic recession which must be what we're heading for if if unless central banks give up on 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 fighting inflation which i think that the obviously the the bull case for risk assets at the moment is look at commodities look at ppi it's coming down but no it's embedded in the service sector in the labor market and wages which are you know in the 70s people below but believed in a trade-off between unemployment and, and, and inflation, and they had to get unemployment up for inflation to come down. And the longer that stays embedded in the economy, the harder it gets um, to, bring it, to bring inflation down. So to my, to my mind, a hard landing is inevitable unless suddenly central banks sort of give up on, on, on fighting inflation. But the more interesting question comes well what happens after that do we go back to money printing and zero interest rates because as we know in western democracies probably we're going to do the easy thing which is print money for nominal growth rather than focus on productivity and hard work um, and i just think artificial intelligence whatever the gap in productivity is artificial intelligence ain't going to get us there here, would you like to add to that? You don't need to. Um, I, I mean, in, infl inflation is over. Um, the, my, my contention is that history, or the history of economics, ended 25 years ago. Um, it, it ended with a policy decision uh, by uh, the Chinese Communist Party, um, that it's industrialization. You know, China in the last 40 years has uh, um, has gone through the same process that America went through over 100 years in the 19th century. Obviously, these things accelerate. Um, when you industrialize, you have remarkable, positive, profitable um, NPV projects, infrastructure projects, whatever, domestically. Your problem is you don't have enough savings um, to finance it. And that's no problem because you run a trade deficit and the rest of the world imports uh, capital and, and funds it. South Korea, the most successful emerging market now developed country. For 40 years, 38 of the 40 years, it ran a trade deficit. Not huge trade deficits, but you know, consistently uh, trade deficits. And its magnificent transformation was funded by the surplus savings of the rest of the world. 
Uh, China rejected that. China is somewhere between Stalin and South Korea. Uh, Stalin uh, went through industrialization mid 1920s. Um, and where does, how does he finance it? Uh, you have to finance it internally. It's a redistribution of wealth within the internal economy. And the trade that he had was to trade the, the bounty of the agricultural food harvest with the Germans. And the Germans would transfer the knowledge and the capital goods, which would facilitate the industrialization of Germany. So it was a redistribution, if you will, from households. Now that redistribution was grotesque. Millions upon millions of poor Russian peasants died. You know, the irony of having this breadbasket economy and, and people died because they, they had no food. It was bartered with, with Nazi Germany. Um, people are not dying in China today, but they're being paid less than all of their endeavors deserve. And mostly they're being paid less in currency terms. So the Chinese currency has many names, Remimbi, Yuan, CNH, CNY. I like to call it red cabbage, forgive me. Um, the remarkable aspect of China's progress. So if we go back 30, 35 years, if you go back to 1994, when the US signed NAFTA with the Canadians and the Mexicans, uh, China devalued its currency. Um, the Chinese economy was the size of Turkey. Today, it's the size of the European Union. Okay. And they've done many wonderful things. And if you've been there, the infrastructure, the damn thing works. Yeah. The currency's devalued. It's gone, it went from 6.4 and it's presently 7.3. Yeah. So what we needed in a system of a, a, a clearing system, economics is all about the pursuit of equilibrium. And the orthodoxy is that their currency should have appreciated and they would be richer vis-a-vis -vis us, vis-a-vis -vis the exchange rate. And therefore their demand for our goods and services would be enhanced. And that hasn't happened. And so we live in a world where there's a reference, Bernanke coined it as this of surplus savings. Surplus savings. Surplus savings mean deficiency of demand. Now, China is not excelling in trade owing to its productivity. It's excelling because it's cheap. And it's, the government has built a moat around you know, the, the manufacturing sector. China today is responsible for a profound glut of manufacturing capacity. And the US and the UK and the Canadians and the Australians, we run deficits, which is to say we are the solution to that glut of capacity. And the reciprocity is that they buy financial assets. They do not buy goods and services. So trade today is a trade war and it's class warfare. When you buy financial assets, Wall Street gets richer and richer. House prices go higher and higher. Elite education gets more and more and more expensive. But for everyone else, with this glut, glut of capacity residing in China, the idea that you're going to embed wage price inflation in this country or in any of the deficit countries is frankly preposterous. So my, forgive me, I'll finish. My complaint today is trade is a class warfare and monetary policy is a class warfare. And it's going to bring our destruction. Thanks, gentlemen. I think I might try and sort of lighten, lighten the mood a bit now, maybe. Um, I've got a question specifically for Barry, but he's more than welcome um, to comment on. And I know this is a subject very close to Barry's heart, but 
Are we over peak ESG? Um, well, let's hope so. Though, but um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I probably think it's a, a progressive thing that the battle's broken out between the Stalinist and the Trotskyist to see who, who's the most pure to the the, the new religion. Um, I must admit, I've always been a, a, a fan of the invisible hand and the benevolence of the of the of the um, the butcher, the brewer, and the baker. Um, and when I look at investing, I think almost ESG is a is a political construct, and one wonders who gets to write the rules, because no one's ever explained to me. This, these rules, this compliance regime which I'm supposed to follow, who actually wrote those rules and what authority do they have? So it's profoundly undemocratic because you know, nobody ever asked me what, what I thought the rules should be. And ultimately, I think it ends up with huge um, capital misallocation um, you know, towards carbon-free hot dogs, flying taxis, solar-powered tanks, none of which we need. But somebody that wrote the ESG rules thinks that we should allocate capital to them. So it is actually just another way that we have low productivity in the economy because we've got this misallocation of capital embedded in the fund management industry. And, you know, I, I mean, I just... I just couldn't, it's not in my personality, it's not in my views of the world to, to, to follow any of this doctrinal stuff. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I did a documentary six months ago called What Have Fossil Fuels Ever Done For Us? Um, basically pointing out that pre-industrial revolution... Um, the average Britain's living standard hadn't really changed since Roman times. And, you know, they were tied to the land um, because there wasn't an energy surplus in the economy that allowed people to live in cities. And then we had this great thing that happened in Elizabethan England, which was they learned how to burn coal. And the amazing thing about coal was just the compactness of the energy, which meant that you got this huge energy surplus when you burnt it, and you could move it around. So you then, because of this energy surplus, you could then turn it into mechanized power. And over, or since the, the Industrial Revolution, the cost of energy has come down by 90%. We use 20 times more energy and GDP per capita has gone up by 30 times. Now, I would suggest that that's connected with our use of fossil fuels and the fact that we stopped using medieval windmills um, uh, and tidal power, and we managed to harness these forms of energy that created a, an energy surplus. Um, and, and I think the, the problem is, when, you, when, we, when, we, when we look at the world at the moment is that over the last 10 years there's been four trillion dollars invested in alternative energy and fossil fuels have gone from 83 percent to 82 percent of all the energy we use alternative energy is just a parasitical industry they have cheap capital they have guaranteed prices and the companies involved in alternative energy still can't make a profit because the product that they use is fundamentally useless. And it's fundamentally useless for two reasons. One is you can't switch it on and off, the intermittency. And, you know, we did some research on this and there was only actually seven days when the wind blew un consistently hard enough um, for, for wind power to have capacity utilization above 80%. And, and many days where it, where it just didn't blow at all. And secondly, you just simply don't create enough energy surplus because the amount of energy that goes into building solar cells with forced Chinese labor, um, just, you just don't get paid back on that by the, the, when the solar panel actually works or, or for, the, for the 
wind turbine, um, the amount of energy that goes into manufacturing it, which is essential that you use fossil fuels, by the way, to manufacture it. So alternative energy is just this fraud that's been per perpetuated on us, that it's somehow a solution to whatever your views on, whatever your views on, on climate change and, and, for the record, mine are sceptical. And I'm reminded of Nigel Lawson's quote that, that net zero stupid solution to a non-existent problem. I'm not necessarily say I would go that far, but if you, if throughout energy transitions, we've always gone um, from um, inferior sources of power to superior sources of power. Um, so we've gone from, um, you know, dried dung to wood to coal to oil. And the only thing that's superior to oil is nuclear power. Um, and yet we don't want to use nuclear power because, um, you know, that, that would just be too simple a solution. It's best to go back to medieval wind and, and, and water. And, and I think the, the bigger worry for me is just the politicians and the people that, that come up with all these policies just don't understand how useless alternative energy is. Um, I read the other day that if the Labour Party get elected in the UK, that we're going to have a 100% renewable grid um, by 2030. And one does wonder whether these people know that we have periods of darkness in the UK and the wind doesn't blow very often. And in fact, in order, in order to, to go to a renewable grid, um, we'd have to spend something like, well, uh, we worked it out that it's more than 100% of GDP, and then you add the storage on top, because they, they also don't recognize that a lithium-ion battery lasts 10 years, there's not enough resources for it. And we worked out that one billion spent on batteries gets you um, eight minutes of storage. So, you know, I think we're, I think uh, uh, a day's storage is 173 billion. So a week storage, which would of course be, you'd have to store alternative energy for even longer than a week if you had no base load that you could switch on and off with nuclear or fossil fuels. Just a week storage would cost you. 1.3 trillion pounds, um, which is obviously more than half of GDP. And, you know, you'd have to keep replacing these things every 10 years as well. And so, so you know, I'm kind of a guy that thinks that, that, that we've already halved our carbon emissions and there's no, there's no pathway to anybody that believes in climate change and net zero turning around and say, oh, we've done this, therefore I expect the temperature to moderate. And there's a reason for that, because actually they don't want a solution that links the two, because the link is tenuous. They don't want to say if we do this, which results in that. They just want to say we need to stop using fossil fuels until we're incredibly poor and we go back to, 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 to medieval standards of living. So, you know, if, if we are going to have a solution, it involves nuclear. And I think I worked out that, that we use about 35,000 um, megawatt hours a day in the UK. That would mean we'd have to build 700 of these small um, nuclear reactors. And that would be costly. That would be like 1.3 billion. The, the, 1.3 trillion, they're incredibly expensive. But at least they would last for 60 years and you could switch them on and off when you want to. Thanks, Barry. Hugh, any comment on that? I mean, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, I think our joint horror is the Extinction Rebellion um, movement. Um, profound consternation that Chris Hone is financing it. You know, he, he flies around the world in a private jet and, and he finances... Um, a preposterous nihilistic movement. Um, I, I actually believe that there is an issue, um, and it's within our resolve to to find solution. Um, I believe that remarkably, the Europeans actually came up with a market-based 
um, idea which works. You know, the, the permit system, if we're going to pollute, you should pay for it. Um, and in the preparation of that system, they gave um, an undue amount of, perm of permits to the polluters to kind of bribe them to kind of accept the system, if you will. And I would like to propose that we do something like that in terms of British households, that we actually move to uh, a, a permitted system of polluting. Um, the, 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 the biggest causes of energy consumption are the most inane, like power drills and stuff like, just borrow one, you know, don't buy another one, etc. cetera. But, um, but you can approximate household carbon footprints. But beforehand, you give people, if you will, tokens or permits, and you say, listen, we're polluting is going to become more and more expensive. And these permits that we've given to you for free are an asset. Yeah. And, and if you can control and reduce your footprint, you're going to be able to hold on to more of these permits. You know, so you're giving a financial incentive to change behavior in the manner that Europe, and indeed the UK has adopted the, the scheme with regard to industrial companies, refiners, chemicals, etc. They've been given a financial incentive and, it, and they were front end loaded with, with free tokens, which kind of, you know, buys, buys their favor. My big thing is trying, we have a, Again, I'm coming back to my pet, pet, pet subject, but we have a, a profound disenfranchised part of our society. We live in a world where asset prices have only risen and risen inexorably, especially since the bogeyman of quantitative easing in March 2009. And, and in March 2009, the system and the equity market had become I like to reference a, a, a rap star you might not know him, but Bobby Digital. The system had become digital. It was either going to reset to zero or not. So zero or one was the option. Yeah, the, the banking system was bankrupt. And the Federal Reserve, I think, made the right decision and this quantitative easing prevented us from going to, going to zero. But in making that decision, they made that decision on behalf of every citizen of America, just like the Bank of England when it makes a decision, it's making a decision on every citizen of the United Kingdom. Um, and there was a cost. So the, the disenfranchised were asked to support, to bail out and help the people that owned the assets. And in the ensuing 14 years, there have been periodic incidences where they've been asked to do it again and again and again. And they've got damn nothing to show for it. They're getting ripped uh, poorer and poorer and poorer. Okay. So what I think we need is sovereign, replicating the Norwegian model, having a sovereign wealth fund. And I promise you, there's going to be an almighty puke in financial assets. And I promise you that the Bank of England and the other central banks will step in at some point and they will support those assets. There will be purchases of assets. And I believe we should be setting up a fund today which is means tested and you get access to that sovereign wealth fund because you are disenfranchised. And when the goons come in and buy and support asset prices, you're going to own a little bit of that, and you're going to become franchised. And with regard to what I see as the cause of this, which is mercantilism, these asset prices, I think, are going up where I disagree with Barry. I don't think it's anything to do with quantitative easing. Again, Japan has had 30 years of quantitative easing. Asset prices haven't gone up. You know? The the cause of it is mercantilism and the purchase of financial assets and bidding them higher and higher and higher. I would charge them. They're not profit-seeking. I would charge them a rent to own financial assets in the United Kingdom and America 
and in the four or five other liberal economies of the world where there is a, a rule of contract law, where there's a democracy, okay? I would charge them the right, and that would finance the setting up of the sovereign fund. But I could, like I say, I came to that, but you could easily put in a kind of carbon permit system as well. We have to give people assets. The Gini coefficient, the, the grotesque income uh, disquality is going to destroy our society. How very robs Pierre of you. I, I think w worth pointing out that, that carbon dioxide isn't a pollutant. The, the one basis point that we find in the air actually causes plants to green and without carbon dioxide there would never be any greening of the of the world so this is the reason why um farmers and, and people with greenhouses pump carbon dioxide into their greenhouses in order to, to grow plants and, and second thing i love the idea of the of the sovereign uk sovereign wealth fund but We've we've got no wealth in the UK, Hugh, and the, and we've not got any. We've not got any. We're not drilling for oil anymore in the North Sea. So I'm going to lighten the mood again, um, and maybe talk about some actionable ideas. The legend Stanley Druckenmiller talks of fat pitches. What are the, what fat pitches are you seeing in these markets, if any, Hugh? Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the genius of, of Stan, you know, Stan compounded at 30% for 30 years. I mean, it's just incredible. And do you know how he did it? A, he's a genius, you know. But B, he never had a down year. Never had a down year. He had lots of 7 8% years, and then he had nine years where you know, he blew it out, you know, the fat pitches. His best year was 99% in the year 1999. Um, I try and encourage people to think quadratically. Um, capital is precious. We work damn hard. And then we, we invest <laughs> in a very cavalier manner. Um, so invest like a pro. I mean, a pro invests on the basis of tenure that we... We, we love investing, and we want to be paid to do it year after year after year. You know? So you think first defense before you go for the fat pitch. And so I think of the world in terms of four quadrants, and you have equities, the S&P. You have government bonds, treasuries. You have alternatives. What are alternatives? Gold, private equity, index-linked securities, um, real estate, Bitcoin. That's like a $100 trillion quadrant. There's a lot of money there. And then you've got cash. And you should be thinking at all times in that quadratic manner. So if I take you through my quadratic expression, equities, you've got to have something, right? There's a risk premium at all times. But personally, me just now, not a lot. If we were, if we were adding up to 100, maybe 15%. What would I own? I'd own bubbles. I'd own the most powerfully exploding uptrends. NVIDIA, Microsoft, Alphabet, uh, Meta, et al., the seven. Um, don't tell me that they're horribly overvalued. I don't care, they're going up. And I've only got 15%. If we turn to the fixed income, intellectually, this is where my prejudice is. I want this to be big. I believe in mean reversion, but mean reversion in these, these, these four compass points of macro. I do not believe in mean reversion in individual stocks. There's too much idiosyncratic nonsense noise, okay? I mentioned, I think, the Bobby Digital, March 2009. The S&P had mean reverted. It had fallen 60%. It was three standard deviations below the norm. If you think of a bell curve, three standard deviations, the, the, the population is very, very small. This is a very rare event. And there was a list as long as my arm about why you should not be buying equities. And of course, we know you should have been. Okay. To me, that's where U.S. treasuries, um, and forgive me, I 
I, I don't live here, and who cares about guilds, really, but uh, treasuries, okay? You have wiped out 15 years of price gains. Now, you've had the income, but the price appreciation, gone. Okay, three standard deviations below. But it's not trending. I only buy things that are going up. It's remarkable the people who buy things going down. I don't understand it. Um, so the compromise for me just now is I'm loaded up on call options. I can get call options um, out to January 2025. And in my world, I always see it. I always see it before everyone else. Don't know why. It's a curse. Um, I need time. I need a lot of time. Um, and the time is really cheap. You know, so the, the treasuries have been shitty the last three months, the last six months, the last nine months. I don't care. I've got a ton of time. And believe me, before January 25, the world's going to rock and it's going to roll and it's going to change. Um, so I'm, I have those options. And then if we can determine a change in the trend, boom, I will go very, very long delta one. Very, very long. Okay. My biggest risk exposure today is Bitcoin. Because when I look at that alternative space, and I, I told you it's uh, $100 trillion. If we take and we assume that those 21 million Bitcoins are mined, and we value them today at the prevailing price, that market is half a trillion dollars, which is to say nothing. Gold is $13 trillion. There's a lot of gold bucks. And I'm like, gold's going to go up three times. Maybe. But if gold goes up three times, it has the same capitalization as all U.S. stocks. Now, I've seen some weird shit in my life, but I just can't think of gold being the same market capitalization of every U.S. stock. If Bitcoin triples, it's one and a half, it's one and a half trillion dollars. It's nothing. The, Apple's three trillion dollars. It's nothing. It doesn't move the meter. Um, so I think when I, and I'm, you know, Barry is your micro guy, I'm your macro guy. When I think of those compass points, the, the one asset class that has the potential to be 3x, 4x is Bitcoin. Okay. Um, it's my largest exposure simply because the volatility is still two to three times greater than any other asset class. And so one has to be careful with that. And then finally, cash. Yeah, I'd have a look. I mean, get 5% on cash. It's pretty cool. The only problem with cash is I can't compound it. We will, we will not be at 5% or higher next year. We will be less. So that's how I would look at it. I think one of the problems of the, 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 the idea of the fat pitch is similar. They don't come around that often, and you have to be incredibly patient to, to wait for them, and in which time you're still expected to make retu- consistent, consistent returns. So... I would say, you know, I'm expecting the next 10 years to be very much like the 70s in terms of um, stop-go cycles Um, because I don't believe that Western democracies are going to put up with the sort of um, uh, purging of the system that is needed in order to get productivity back. So we're just going to pretend that we've got growth by printing money and accept that we've got nominal growth instead of real GDP growth. Um, if I look at the world at the moment, I don't think there are any fat pitches because even though I'm bearish on on um, the economy, um, I think that I, I I think the market will be rightly skeptical about whether we're heading for a deflationary, a long-term deflationary bust. So. And the starting point is a yield curve, which is already massively inverted. So I think buying duration here, you, you may well get a, a, a recession where, where you know, the yield curve flattens because short rates come down, but long rates don't really move that much. And as Hughes rightly pointed out, um, unless you're massively levered, you're not going to make a lot of money on, on two-year bonds. And I also probably think 
we've maybe got one more inflation scare in us and, and, and rates may go higher bef- and that, that is the thing that finally bursts, bursts the dam. Barry, Barry, we all want to know what's your favourite long, what's your favourite short? Are you the genius when it comes to this? Well, I'm not sure, I'm, not oh, sure I'm a genius. What's gone. the reveal? We um, well, I'm just very stock specific at the moment. I mean, we have... I don't, I don't need, I don't, I, throughout my career, I've found it, it's, a it's not a secret, but if you have favorites, you don't think rationally about them, do you? It's, uh, you know, these are all things that you, you own for a reason, and they do a job in the portfolio, and I've got, you know, I'm fighting five or six mini battles on the long book, and five or six mini battles in, in, the, in, in the short book. One of them is I'm still short. U.S. regional banks because I can't see how they I can't see how their their net interest margins sustain um, higher funding costs. So you know the bulls of the U.S. regional banks will say, "Oh, you know the crisis is dealt with. The banks aren't losing deposits anymore." Yeah, but only because they're paying through their nose for deposits in order so they can kid the markets that they they don't have a. Uh, a liquidity problem so net interest margins are going to contract and then if that doesn't get them the downturn in the economy is going to get them in terms of in terms of loan losses i think you know the, the uk domestic economy is in a is in a lose lose situation at the moment where you know rates are going higher um we are more vulnerable to higher rates in this country than than the US is. So, you know, we are heading for a big recession in the UK, followed by a Labour government. So, I mean, I'm not quite sure how there's a there's a bullish case there for for for, for um, UK assets. And I think what's been noticeable about the last couple of weeks is we've started to see real economy profit warnings. So just about every chemical company in Europe has had a profit warning with actually volume declines that are that are, that are, that are pretty massive. Um, so these companies were a little bit hiding the volume declines while pricing power was still strong. And now, obviously, with the shift in in commodities, they've got no pricing power and they've got negative volume growth. So I think you know a lot going on, but I think. Um, you know, just have to be patient to wait for the fat pitch and the fat pitch to buy. The fat pitch is usually a fat pitch to buy risk assets, isn't it? No one ever says it's a fat pitch to to short everything for the end of the world. Um, and I think we're going to have to wait for things to get worse before they get better. But I think the obvious thing to do now is to park your money in cash or short-term bonds or, or zero coupon Guilts where you're not theoretically going to have to pay any capital gains tax on the yield to maturity and just accept 5 6% return while you conserve capital so you've got capital to put back in the market in the recession with lower um, equity prices and also, you know, lower interest rates. So that kind of, you know, there's, there's a cycle to this and it's keeping it simple. So I have one last topic before we move to questions, and hopefully you can answer this very briefly. Um, can we talk about the future of active fund management? Yeah, are you coming back, Hugh? I'm the damn smartest person in finance, um, and I dress like a hobo um, because I just, I just can't deal with dumb people. Um, the... Um, I'd, yeah, you know, I, I, I would love a chance again. Um, the, the, sometimes the ball is the size of a ping pong, and sometimes it's like an inflatable castle, you know. And I'd like to jump up and down in an inflatable castle. Like, there's so much uh, profit opportunity out there just now. Uh, but is it going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. Like, people come to me and say, hey, do an ETF. Do you, know what it, do you know what the management fee is on an ETF in the US? 15 basis points. <laughs> I mean, you know, be better off selling asset capitalist hats for 100 bucks. Um, and, you know, um, to beat, to not be the crowd, to beat it, right, 
you got to be weird. You got to be different. And there's just all these suits, and they don't want it. They don't want it. Like the biggest asset allocators spend all of their day on their knees, groveling to try and get an allocation with Millennium and Citadel, and da da da. I probably da-da-da. spent the first ten years of Argonaut thinking exclusively about other people's businesses rather than my own business, and part of that was that I never had any period of failure where I had to think more deeply about how my business differed from other fund managers and how I would be able to compete with companies with far more resources behind them than what I ever would have. So I think my epiphany came when, you know, it became more difficult. And then I thought, well, if I'm if there's a future from active management, I have to actually do something different, not just in terms of... Um, you know, viewpoints and, and, and PR, but also in terms of the product. And certainly, if you look at ESG, as we had earlier, that is a prime example of an industry which is really struggling because generating consistent performance is difficult. So let's just say, don't worry about the performance. We're, we're doing good in life or doing good with your, your, your capital. But I think it's... The, the way the active fund management has tried to respond to the passive threat is things like ESG and mergers, which is obviously most of them have failed and they've made the fund management industry a far um, less enjoyable place to be. So my view, my view has just been to do a, a return that complements passive that comes at different time that is uncorrelated. And I think he was renowned for that at one stage. Gents, thank you so much. Now, we will open up to questions. Well, I've got one, actually, Hugh. Is there any way that you'd ever open on the, the five people that know money? It's, ge- it's genius, right? Yeah. It's, it's the red rope. It's the VIP. Everyone wants in. Who are the five? Who are the five? Um, and it, it came to me because literally I was, with one hand, trying to count the people that I, I watch, I listen attentively and, and, and who stretch my mind and that they tell me things that I hadn't quite appreciated. And I'm not sure that it's actually fine. <laughs> um, and part of it came from when I was actively managing money. Um, I was shamefully, I want to say, unaware of the, the euro dollar, the offshore private banking metrics, which prints money. Um, Non-sovereign dollar creation via counterparties is, we don't know because the central banks don't measure it. It's really weird. But I would posit the guess that it could be 80% of all the money that's printed is printed offshore via the euro dollar system. And euro dollar is a misnomer. The biggest center of money printing has been Tokyo. And actually, if we want to talk about fat pitches, um, there's something extraordinary going on and you're not reading about it um, in the financial press. Um, So yes, you know that uh, dollar yen, yen is, is weak. Really weak, weak in the sense of if you bring up a 25-year chart, I need lots of data. I, the people that send me like three-month charts, I mean, I just want to slap them. Um, it's so significant that it's imparting and impacting rather on direction and it's presenting thought bubbles saying 200, 300, like real, real weakness. Yeah. Second thing that's happening, which again, you know, is that the Nikkei and Japanese equities are surging. And again, we know that the peak was back in 1989, so 30 years of price data, and it's surging and it's, it's making you go thought bubble 40,000. If we take 40,000, we go to 60,000. Actually, if we take 40, we go to 80,000. And you're going, wow. Yeah? Yeah, and you're trying to deconstruct all of this incoming. Another thing that they don't tell you is that those Japanese equities are surging and vol is going higher. And that's really, really damn interesting. 
really, really damn interesting. Um, so what do we make of all that? We don't know. Let me hazard a guess. Uh, you heard Barry and I kind of like QE's printing money and stuff, and I'm like, no, it's laundromat tokens. Could be money if you use the tokens, but there's been no desire. You know, the banks went bankrupt 15 years ago, and they're like, we don't want to do it again. You know, you cut our bonuses. We don't like that, okay? Um, what if the Japanese banks actually decided they became emboldened to use those bank reserves? What if they took all those bank reserves and they go to, into... I'm going to say euro dollar. Euro dollar is a pawn shop. Think of it as a pawn shop, right? You take your watch in, and the guy says, yeah, I'll give you 100 bucks. Okay? But if you don't come back tomorrow, I'm selling the 100 bucks. I'm selling your watch, rather. Uh, and what if Japanese banks, enormous banks, they've got no loans. There's no desire to lend domestically in Japan. What if they went to the pawn shop and they said, hey, look, I've got a trillion dollars worth of JGB bills. You know. What were you giving me in return? And they go, well, we'll give you a trillion dollars. No haircut, we'll give you a trillion dollars. I'm like, really? Like, yeah, sure. But you've got to come back at 12 o'clock tomorrow and we reserve the right to change our mind. And, and we might ask you, we might ask for different collateral, right? And effectively, what you're doing is you're opening a, a short dollar, long yen position. And what if they pursued their corporate, gigantic corporate clients that have just spent the last 15 years piling into China? And what if they actually went, this is a 24-hour loan. What if they took term risk? What if they took commercial risk and lent into China? These are just what ifs, okay? But when you look at the movement in dollar yen, it coincides with people kind of starting to get it that China is busted. It coincides with the property market thing being exposed. It coincides with the GDP calculator no longer working. They can't do five. And, the, and at, at the pawn shop, the guy's like, you got to come back. Yeah. And it's like, you know what? I need dollar bills. I need three-month treasuries or else I'm closing you out. So if you want to keep that line of credit, what do you do? you got to sell yen and you got to buy dollars. And you got to do that in size. And that's the size, I think, you're seeing in the currency market. And it looks as if that is, there's a lot more unwind. And that actually could be the inflation. Yeah. But that means you're going to buy Japanese credit. So just for the recording, Dom asking about wage inflation, increase in productivity, and how that's going to work out. Um, okay, so... so as I think I said earlier, one out of every 14 um, people in the UK workforce is now signed off long-term sick. You could say that's because the NHS shut down for non-COVID-related matters in 2020, or you could say that people got used to being at home and, and, and getting paid for it and, and fancy doing it long-term. Um, I think that if we look at the labour market in the UK, it's very tight. There are no, there's, a, there's an absence of, of, of new people coming into the market. Um, and that's obviously not just a factor in the UK and the US, but frankly, every Western economy, as, you, as you've pointed out. So I don't know where they've all gone. Um, and it's probably a little bit like where, where do flies go in the winter? Nobody really knows. Um, but you know, if if if, if it, it, it's obviously a 
a key problem and why and why why I don't think you can get wages down without a without a big recession it's kind of like you know what um Andrew Mellon said to President Hoover in the 1930s that you have to purge labor purge stocks purge the farmers purge real estate and you and 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 you purge the rottenness from the system Personally, I don't think there's the political appetite for that, and that's why um, inflation will probably be more of a structural problem than than, than what it needs to be. Yeah, because it's, it's a great question. I can't do it justice with the time. Um, the problem in the world is we need wage price inflation. We got to pay the real folk good money. We have a deficiency of demand. Because you've got 1.4 billion Chinese people who are not getting paid enough, whose currency is not going up, and where they're not buying our goods and services. And, they're, and, and ordinary folk are having to work at Amazon sorting stations. Right? And you, you, hit a point, you hit a point, which is genius, right? Um, energy costs. We had energy inflation in the 70s and 80s, okay? And what did it bring on? Investment. Investment was necessary to control this cost inflation. Okay. We need wage price inflation, I think you were hinting at that, to bring the investment to deal with it. Now that doesn't happen today. GDP growth has three variables. Population growth, you know, that's not happening productivity, and it's not happening. Maybe we're measuring it wrong, but it's not happening in the stats. And then you've got debt growth, okay? And we know that debt growth goes up, and debt growth requires asset prices to go up to support ones versus the other. So let's work on the productivity issue. No commercial Western guy is going to invest in a world of deficient demand. Capacity utilization for American stock and plant, 79% and heading lower. No one's investing. There's no wage price inflation apart from this stupid COVID thing. And it will pass. It will pass with the most grotesque economic decline. Central banks are targeting and trying to push wages down and mercantilism is squashing wages, and we're left today, 14 years after 2008. US GDP per capita has expanded by 18%, 1.8. Let's take the 14 years from 1930, and you're at, and the expansion is 78%. The last 14 years for the average folk have been so much worse than the Great Depression. And no one gets it. The policymakers are idiots. But everyone thinks I'm the idiot. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. I look forward to having drinks with you. Hugh and Barry, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to a Different Perspective, a Zeus podcast. If you'd like to feature on the podcast or get in touch, you can contact me on live at zeuscapital.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.